All right, well, I think it's about that time. So we're gonna get this party started. Thank you so much for joining me today. I am really excited to do this for C4. And my name is Sarah Buino. I am a psychotherapist in Chicago, and I do specialize in addiction, shame, and trauma. And yeah, that's probably all you need to know about me. So just a little bit of housekeeping stuff. Uh, there is a box where you're going to be able to ask questions. Um, and actually, let me see if I can pull that question box up. Nope, can't get it right now. I'll figure that out in a second, but um, you can ask questions. Um, we'll kind of see how it goes. I'm, I'm just going to play it by ear as to whether I ask questions as we go along or answer questions as we go along or whether I hold them till the end, but feel free to just type them at whatever point that they come up for you so that we can go back to them. And then at the end, please stick around. There is a poll afterwards that um, you can give me information about how I did and let C4 know, you know, what other topics you might want to, uh, learn, uh, and give us information. So if you can stick around at the end and I'll remind you again. So let's get this party started. All right. So there we go. So today we're going to talk a little bit about burnout, compassion, fatigue, rest out and vicarious trauma. I am just going to take a leap and guess that that is a topic that you've probably heard a lot about before. So <clears throat> to me, that's not exactly the important piece. We know that that happens. The important piece to me is really digging into what can we do to take care of ourselves so that we don't get to the point of burnout, compassion, fatigue, rest out, and vicarious trauma. We're going to look at the eight areas of wellness and how they can support us to be <clears throat> healthy, healthy therapists or counselors in this field. And I'm going to invite you to analyze your own self-care strategies and to create an individualized plan to decrease stress. Now, I wish that if we were in person, I would be you know, really challenging us to do this together live. So I'm hopefully going to give you all the information so that you're able to come up with a, a self-care plan for yourself. So, who is a wounded healer? Well, this is my podcast, and yes, this is a very clever way to, <laughs> to advertise my own podcast, but the reason that I share this is I've been, it's been almost two years now that I've been doing the podcast, and I interview other people in healing professions, so not just therapists and addiction counselors, but all sorts of people, and the questions that I always ask are, how do you feel about the word healer and how do you feel about the term wounded healer as applied to your work? And so a lot of what I'm talking about today is informed by, I think, probably over 100 interviews with people about those terms and how they apply to helping take care of self while you're taking care of others. Um, so I told you what the objectives are, but this is a little bit of a bait and switch. Not really. But this webinar is a call to action. I teach new social workers and I do a lot of speaking gigs. And one of the, one of the biggest barriers that I have found uh, with folks that I work with uh, from, the, from the teaching side is sometimes people are really afraid to do their own work. And when we are afraid to do our own work, we might be hurting others and not really understand that. So this is a call to action today. And it's an invitation, you know, right now we're in this call out culture where, you know, we're, we're canceling people if they do one thing wrong. And this is not that this is not, uh, this is not to shame anyone. This is not to point fingers at anyone. This is a, an invitation, a call in, because I really want to invite people to continue to do their own work so that we're able to help others as much as humanly possible. So that is my commitment to you today to, to call you in. So why do we become helping professionals? So one of the obvious reasons is that we want to help others and that's the, you know, the very altruistic reason. Uh, the kind of flip side of that altruistic reason is sometimes we feel this need to help others and this, this real, I don't feel like I have worth unless I'm helping others. And so we're going to talk a little bit about countertransference in the next couple slides and what that might mean for, for people who identify that way. Me is one of them. Uh, a desire to do meaningful work. I, I can use my husband as an example. He just graduated uh, getting his MSW and he went back to school at 39 and was working in PR. 
you know, and we would always joke, he would come home and there'd be some sort of PR emergency and he's working at, at a, at a big name food company. And I was like, you know, like Oreos really aren't an emergency. Like <laughs> what I'm dealing with is like addiction and trauma and suicidality. And that that's, those are real emergencies. And, and, you know, he really was like, you're right. I'm, I'm, I don't feel like I'm contributing to this world when I'm just talking about Oreos all day long. So he made the leap uh, to do some more meaningful work so that, so that he could feel better about the contribution he was making to this world. And recognizing that our values match well with our work. So I think, you know, again, this desire to help others, wanting to contribute to, to this world is, is one of the reasons that we go into it. Another one that I, I didn't list here, but I, I always claim for myself is, I came from a family where there, I had a lot of question marks because it didn't feel good in my family and I didn't really have the language to, to speak it and understand it until I became a therapist. So truthfully, a lot of it for me was this, this discovery of really what, what happened to me in my, in my childhood. And so sometimes it's, it's our personal trauma that lead us into this work, right? So I saw this quote on Instagram and I just thought it was so profound. If you never heal from what hurt you, you will bleed on people who didn't cut you. So I have, I have an example of this with, uh, with two clients actually. So um, it's so interesting. I find that whenever I shift internally myself, I find that my clients, the energy that's attracted to me changes and I'd been working with these two clients for quite some time, actually, but the work changed from more of an addiction focus to more of a trauma focus. And both of them needed to go to a higher level of care in terms of trauma. And I, I've been working in addiction for, for 10 years now. I really, I know what I'm doing. And I have this, I have this internal kind of stop mechanism that tells me when I'm working harder than, than the client and, and that I need to invite them to kind of take ownership of their part. But when it comes to trauma, I don't have that internal mechanism yet. And I did so much consultation on both of these cases because what happened for me is I was bending over backwards in order to try to put all the pieces in place and fix, manage, and control and make sure that these clients were going to get what they needed to heal. And it's interesting. One client is still in treatment. He went to a three-month treatment program and another one left after 10 days. And I kind of have a feeling that the one that left after 10 days, I kind of, I'm, I'm looking at it in my own consultation and supervision to figure out what what it, what in my behavior or the way that I interacted with this client impacted impacted their ability to remain, remain in treatment. Maybe it was that they didn't really want to go in the first place. And my urgency was, was somehow pushing them to do something that they weren't ready to do. So I think that this is a really important quote to think about in terms of why it's so important to do our own work. So why might we struggle to do our own work? Uh, the first one I put there, fear. All humans fear or dislike pain, right? I think that's part of the human condition that, that humans suffer. And I think specifically our American culture tells us that we shouldn't be in pain, that happiness is the default. And that's really where we should be. And if we're not, we're doing something wrong. But when, but when we're realistic about it, we recognize that we experience a whole host of emotions every single day for, for so many different reasons. And so um, just thinking about how fear gets in the way of doing our own work, um, we need to meet that fear. I, there's a book, I think, called Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway. And that's something that I think about in terms of, of my relationship to fear, because sometimes people will call me fearless and I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> I am not fearless. I just happen to have a relationship with fear. Um, and actually, for me, it's, it's my relationship with faith. I believe that I'm going to be okay no matter what. And so fear doesn't stop me from doing the things that I feel like I am supposed to do, even when there might be pain on the other side. The next one being shame. So shame is from Brene Brown's definition, the intensely painful feeling that we are not worthy of love and belonging. And I think when it is in terms of 
you know, people in the mental health field doing our own work, there's this fear of if I really tell people what's going on inside of me, or if I'm struggling, then I'm not a good enough therapist or I'm not a good enough counselor. And, and we have this imposter syndrome that can follow us. There's a really, really great podcast called the Modern Therapist Survival Guide. And their, I think it was their first episode of this year or, or the first episode of last year, um, talked about this, this very thing. And that's what I talk about on my podcast all the time about this, this fear that we have to be okay. We have to be at a certain level. We have to keep it together um, when really we're doing a disservice to ourselves and our clients if we're trying to bypass this shame. And then next, pride. So I'm, I'm in a training program right now, and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about that on the next slide, but they talk about um, pre presentations of people in terms of shame-based presentations or pride-based presentations. And when I talk about pride-based presentations, I think about, you know, not narcissistic in a personality disordered way, but essentially narcissistic pride that, um, that it's a cover. It's truly a cover for fear. You know, those of us in the mental health field know that if you're really working with a true narcissist, there is a lack of sense of self underneath. And so I think that when pride shows up for us as a cover for not wanting to do our self work, it can, it can really just be a mask for fear. And then finally, not valuing the importance of inner life. I see this a lot with my students, um, not all my students, but every once in a while, I, I'm very vehement about telling my students that going to our own therapy is part of the process of learning to be a therapist. And sometimes I'll get a little like, huh? what do you mean by that? Um, and my fear is, is that folks who don't put that value on doing the work for their inner lives have this masked desire for the power differential that automatically shows up in therapy, right? I think that we as therapists want to invite a client to be on the same plane with us, but no matter how much we make that invitation, a client is always going to look at us as the expert. And if we essentially position ourselves as the expert and knowing everything about the client experience, that's actually setting us up for, for failure. So, so not valuing the importance of inner life, I think is something that's, that's important to look at. And then I'd love to hear if you, you know, it's not a question, but if you want to type into the chat box, other things you can think of that get in the way of us doing our self work. So empathy and the therapist, I told you, I was going to tell you about this training program that I'm in right now. And I, completely stole this couple, the, these next couple slides from them, um, and they know it, so that's why I quoted it down there. So NARM is a neuroaffective relational model, and it is the only trauma model that focuses on developmental and relational trauma. So <clears throat> just very briefly, we know shock trauma is a, a single incident event that is truly life-threatening, whereas developmental and relational trauma can be chronic misattunement, uh, that happens over a long period of time. And so in the training program, one of the things that we focused a lot on is countertransference and how important it is to take a look at that and, uh, and if it's affecting the way that we show up in the room with clients. So we all have been taught empathy is a good thing, right? And, and I'm a caveat, I'm not saying that empathy is a bad thing whatsoever, but it's super important to look at the fact that there's always a light and a dark side to everything, right? Jung talked a lot about the shadow and about integrating our shadow so that we're able to be our whole selves in relationship to others. And so that's really what I'm talking about in terms of empathy. So we know the benefits of empathy, right? You know, we can meet others where they are, deepen awareness and understanding, create safe and secure relationships, enhance connection and pleasure, but then the risks of unmanaged empathy, like I talked about with my client experience earlier, emotional contagion. So Brene Brown talks about, if you've ever seen, she's got an empathy, uh, empathy versus sympathy video. And one of the things that happens in the video is kind of this hole opens up and, and the, the person who is hurting kind of goes down. And then there's, uh, there's a little bear who climbs down. And Brene Brown has always talked about, we can't jump into the hole without a way to get out. And if we do that, we're actually at risk 
of hurting the other person or just being stuck ourselves and not being able to help the person in that way. So when we're experiencing emotional contagion, it's, it's this experience of where do my emotions end and begin and where, where are the clients here? Um, so blurring boundaries, very similar. So what's theirs and what's mine, right? So if I'm sitting in the room with a client and I, I tend to notice a lot of what happens with me somatically, and if a client's telling me something and I'm getting butterflies in my stomach, I have to be able to really tune into, is that my experience based on something that's happening for me and what the client is saying, or is that something that is, that is actually the clients that I'm tuning into? Uh, being triggered right? We get triggered by our clients all the time. And I was, I was actually just dealing with this with one of my staff members who um, had a client who, who their drug of choice was uh, one of her parents' drug of choice. And, you know, she got so triggered by it and there was so much fear around it. And we had to really just kind of, kind of sit and create some space for um, letting her nervous system settle back down so that we could figure out what it was we needed to do with this case. And then my personal favorite, <laughs> feeling over, overly responsible or burdened, that's one of the things that, that happens to me quite often. And you know, one of the messages that I was taught in childhood was essentially that you always have to bend over backwards for people. That is how you show love is by sacrificing yourself. And guess how tired that makes me. Ooh, so tired. So this is, this is an area where I know I really need to continue to develop awareness and continue to get consultation uh, and, and support when these things show up for me. So empathy and the therapist continued. So when we empathize, we become vulnerable to the feelings associated with not being able to affect change in our client's suffering. So I think this has a lot to do with the fact that I mentioned earlier, our culture kind of expects that we're going to be happy and we're going to be okay. And so a lot of times our clients will come in and they'll, they'll give up all this power and they'll say, well, you fix it. I have a handful of clients that, that every time they have an emotion, well, how do you make it? How do I make it stop? How do you make it stop? And being a person who feels overly burdened and the need to sacrifice for people, I really have to kind of slow myself down and sit with the fact that I might not be able to change every person. And how do I sit with that, right? It's one thing about how I relate to the client, but how do I sit with that at the end of the day? Um, so can we sit with not fixing, even when a client wants us to? And the last two bullet points there, our presence is cultivated from being and not doing, right? I'm sure everyone has heard the phrase, we are human, human beings, not human doings. And again, we all just get caught up often in this treadmill of just doing, 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 doing. And, and I'm definitely a person who learned that her worth revolved around how much she accomplished. And so again, another, another place to, to look inward and look at how that's affecting clients. And then I'm curious uh, if folks want to write into the chat box too, what you learned about countertransference when you were in school, because I remember I graduated 10 years ago and I remember being essentially taught that we don't want countertransference, like countertransference isn't necessarily a good thing. And, you know, from a, from a more psychodynamic perspective, we recognize that countertransference isn't bad or wrong, it's information. And if we are denying that information or trying to suppress that information, we're actually doing both ourselves and the client a disservice. So here, unmanaged empathy points to places where the therapist needs to heal. And I think I've, I've given you plenty examples of how that shows up in, in my experience, in my practice. So the, helping, the hazards of the helping profession uh, we're not going to spend a great deal of time on this because, as I said, I'm pretty sure that everyone has been to a webinar that's about burnout, uh, and I really want to get to the stuff that heals us, but I do want to at least make sure that we all have the same language about these things. So if you want to learn more, that website, that proqual.org is a really good place to, to look for more information about um, professional quality of life. That's what it stands for, the professional quality of life study. So. Rust out is essentially folks who've been in the field for a long time and maybe they're just waiting for retirement 
they're just waiting out the clock um, and they might not be doing the things to care for themselves. They might not have the empathy uh, or the patience with clients that is really required to do the work. Um, so this is one type of burnout that you will see. Um, you know, professional burnout, deterioration in job performance due to contact in high stress work environments, which if we're working in mental health and addiction, all of us qualify for that. So here are some of the symptoms to burnout that I'm sure everyone at some point in their career has been familiar with. And then factors that lead to burnout. So a lot of these things are, are systemic and we're gonna talk about that a little bit more in several slides. Uh, so high caseloads of clients, really that's, that's not always something that we can change if we're in community mental health or we're working in treatment centers. You know, these things are dictated by larger systems. And so how do we figure out how to take care of ourselves when we're working in an environment that might not be able to support the type of self-care that we need? Um, and then down at the end there, ineffective self-care practices is exactly why we're here today. So vicarious traumatization is essentially the same thing as secondary trauma. So you're, you're going to hear those, those terms and they, they really mean the same thing. And vicarious trauma is really um, us having traumatic uh, symptoms, not from our own traumatic experiences, but the traumatic experiences of our clients. And so sometimes it's just hearing, you know, the same, same really difficult stories over and over. Um, and, and sometimes just be, being in the environment where nervous systems are, are on high alert all the time can also, we can, we can have the, that mirror neuron response of, of increased activity in our nervous systems as well. And the symptoms are just that of PTSD, which we are all familiar with. So one of the things is what puts us at higher risk and lower risk for these? adverse childhood experiences. So studies have shown that the more ACEs a therapist or counselor has, the more susceptible they may be to burnout and secondary trauma. So if you're not familiar with the ACEs study, Vincent Felitti is the doctor who conducted the study. It was initially uh, supposed to be a study on weight loss, but they ended up finding that people would sabotage themselves when they got very close to their goal. And those folks who would sabotage themselves often shared a trauma history. And so they came up with these 10, 10 domains, essentially, uh, where if we experience trauma, these tend to lead to chronic illness, more susceptible to addiction, more susceptible to mental health issues, which then, of course, can lead to, to burnout or vicarious trauma. So this, the, the ACEs don't obviously cover everything that is traumatic. It doesn't cover anything really about developmental trauma. Um, you know, it doesn't cut doesn't cover misattunement or spiritual abuse, um, but this the, you can take these tests online and just, just count how many ACEs you have. And I think what they say is that an ACE score of four, like four is where it becomes, um, where you become at, more at risk for developing addiction, mental health issues, and, and so on. And then this study was done with members of NADAC, and they found that addiction counselors and, and secondary traumatic stress or vicarious traumatization go hand in hand because at least 50, 59% of people met at least one criterion for PTSD, 28% met two criteria, 19% met full criteria. So that's a pretty robust number of folks who are, who are traumatized people working in the field. And so the higher, the counselors who scored higher on the secondary trauma scale also reported lower job satisfaction. And my guess would be is because they may not have felt they had the capacity to do their job because of this, this trauma experience. And I want to give a little caveat for, you know, PTSD is, I think that, that, that and reactive attachment disorder dealing with trauma. I think those are the only two trauma diagnoses that we have in the DSM. And complex post-traumatic stress disorder should be in the DSM, probably I think the next one because it will be adopted in the ICD. But this study was only done in terms of PTSD. But I would guess that the numbers would be at least doubled if we were talking about complex post-traumatic stress disorder. 
So what is resilience? And you may have heard the term post-traumatic growth. And the thing that I find interesting about post-traumatic growth is it's not a static process, right? I, I tell my clients all the time, and I'm sure folks listening to this also tell their clients that, you know, recovery isn't just a one and done situation. We have to, we have to have a practice every day of gratitude, self-compassion, whatever it else it is that we need in our, in our daily care routine. And so it's not just static. We have to continue to cultivate it. And that's what we're going to talk about now. So one of the things that I have found, you know, I'm, I'm always trying to get to the root of a problem. That's just kind of the way my mind thinks. Like every time I hear something, I'm like, ooh, let's drill down and get to the deeper part of it. And I've found a lot lately that when people are presenting issues or, or questions, I'm always like kind of getting bigger and bigger and going into the macro way of thinking of things. And so this, this uh, comic that we're going to look at here is an example of kind of the different layers of, of self-care. How do we take care of ourselves and, and how is the system responding to take care of people? So uh, Deanna, Vans, or Deanna Zant, uh, she's an artist clearly making this comic. And so she differentiates self-soothing and self-care. So self-soothing are activities that provide distraction or comfort in difficult times, which there's definitely room for self-soothing, right? If we had to feel the vastness of all our emotions all of the time, I don't know, I don't know that we would survive. Um, you know, and this is, we know this is why folks turn to substances, right? And then when it becomes chronic, it becomes addiction. Um, but self-soothing is a really important uh, tool that we have in order to kind of soften, soften for ourselves. And then self-care. So self-care uh, she defines as activities that help you find meaning that support your growth and groundedness. So you can see kind of the difference if I go back here, bubble bath, right? You know, I, I, I don't know why bubble bath is the thing that sometimes people are like, oh, you need to take care of yourself. Go take a bubble bath or get a massage, right? Those, both of those things are here. But do those actually help you find meaning and support your growth and groundedness? No. But they're lovely things that, that it's wonderful to, to utilize. Um, but so we have things here like going to therapy, meditating, napping, taking care of finances, eating well, keeping and setting boundaries, saying yes and no when you really mean it. So these things are more aligned with self-care. And then we move towards community care. So, you know, if we think about access to treatment, I, I've always, you know, when I was in school, I remember reading a lot about access to treatment specifically for women. And one of the barriers to treatment for women is childcare, right? And I have had so many women who um, were going to treatment and really concerned about what was going to happen with their children. And so we see on the top left there, childcare is really a community care issue. It's not an individual issue. And unfortunately, the more individualized and the more siloed our society becomes, the less we can rely on our community to help us with those sorts of things. So community care being workarounds for systems that don't inherently support care. And she says, I eat capitalism. And I just want to give the caveat that I am not an economist. So I do not know what other, I guess, uh, economic <laughs> systems are going to be more supportive. So I don't have the answer to that question of, of, of you know, how we're going to fix that. But, uh, but Obviously, a lot of these things that are, that are listed on here are not necessarily supported by our society. And then finally, structural care. So these things get even bigger. So systems that support community care, self-care, and self-soothing. And I'm sure that we can all agree that, you know, having a living wage is so important for people. Paid family leave, identity freedom, comprehensive universal health care. One of the things that just hurts my soul more than anything is the cost of treatment right now. And having owned and run an IOP for a very short time myself, I understand why it costs so much to run programs. But when there's not insurance to, to help people out, it can be so such a barrier for people. And so 
I, I'm always asking the question, how can we get better access to care? How can we get our country more focused on health and mental health so that we are able to create shifts and get people to be able to change? So it's really, really important for us to vote. You know, I don't mean to get political here, but if we are supporting politicians and policies that are supporting structural care that are really going to help us help our society thrive, we're only all going to benefit. And, you know, I think those of us with, with a certain level of privilege may not need all of these things, but I imagine that all of us have worked with clients who are in need of these things. And so we can all get on board with that being important. Just checking the time, making sure we're doing okay. Okay, now we get to the meat of things. So the eight areas of wellness. So SAMHSA had this initiative, and I want to say it was 2006. Yep, 2006. So this initiative to essentially ask the question, what is healthy, right? Because when we look at the DSM, we look at pathological things. We look at symptoms. We look at what's not working. And what's also not working is just looking at what's not working, right? So if we can, if we can really understand what creates health, then we're going to better be able to move people towards health. And, you know, kind of going back to this global perspective, the healthier we are as therapists, the more helpful we can be to clients. And then also I want to extend it to, you know, the healthier that parents are the healthier that their children can be. You know, I've been, I've been really thinking about the, the ways that mental health has moved and shifted over the past several generations. And I think it's amazing that, so I'm, I'm Gen X and then we've got millennials and then Gen Z and millennials and Gen Z are so demonstrative about going to therapy. There are therapy memes all over the place. And I think it's amazing because what the culture has finally done is normalized therapy and made it okay for us to want to go get therapy. And that was not the case for my parents' generation, the boomers. So look how far we've come in just, what, 40 years, I think, uh, which is pretty incredible. So this model really looks at what is wellness instead of illness. And these are all the beliefs that essentially underline this initiative. So recovery is possible, right? I, I really truly hold the belief that there's nobody who can't recover. If somebody can't recover, I like to think that it's a systems issue and not a personal issue. Uh, I think that we could do a great service to our clients if we were looking at how do our systems, how are our systems working with trauma and the addiction field? Not great truthfully not great. You know, whenever we identify a, a client as being resistant, I think we are letting ourselves off the hook from changing a system that could better serve our clients. Um, underlying trauma or anxiety affects our mental and physical health. Just look at any of the research done on the ACEs studies, and that is 100% proven. Uh, recovery involves balance, and recovery requires community support. One of the things I always tell my clients is that we cannot recover alone. I believe that for addiction and I believe that for trauma as well. Um, when you're hurt in relationship, you need to heal in relationship. And so it might not be 12 step for everybody. It may be other forms of community care. I always tell my clients, whatever community you're involved in, I just want them to be focused on being the best version of themselves. And if that encourages you to show up as the best version of yourself, that's always what I'm looking for. And then finally, routine and regular habit supports recovery. So as I said earlier, all of these things are practices. It's not just going to be one and done and, and I've got everything figured out. We need to do these things on a regular basis. So let me take a sip. Before we go into each of these areas of wellness and, and kind of turn it on ourselves, I want to ask you a couple questions to think about. So it's the beginning of the year. I'm sure many of us have goals, you know, intentions, resolutions, and they're all extraordinarily well-meaning, but are we setting ourselves up for success or are we setting ourselves up potentially for failure? So as you're going through, as we're going through these different areas of wellness, I really want you to, to hone in on these questions for yourself and really think about, is this goal too big? 
right? When we're doing treatment planning for our clients, we do smart goals, right? Is this goal, is this goal realistic is one of the, is, is, isn't it? Isn't that the R? I don't remember. I teach this stuff, but I don't always remember. But essentially, we want to make sure that this is actually achievable. Is it possible for the person to do this goal? So when you're thinking about your goals for yourself, is it too big or is it just right? Just like Goldilocks. Uh, does your goal actually belong under community care or structural care, right? So you know, if, if you are a parent and you're in need of more child care, is that actually within your power to change or is that really a systemic thing? Um, you know, and, and one of the ways I think we can be creative is if something doesn't exist, I tend to be the person to create it. So, you know, I, I am always looking to build community as a way to get information and support from other people rather than trying to have to figure it out myself. So just think about your goals in terms of that. Um, and that kind of goes along with, are there barriers to your goal that are outside of control, uh, outside of your control? So, you know, if childcare is something that you struggle with, you know, money is an issue with that, 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 you know, sure we could get a different job, but that's not always going to solve the problem. So, do we need other people to support us in moving past the barriers to our goals? And then finally, and one of the most important things I, I think is, was your goal actually your goal or was it internalized based on somebody else's idea of what you should do? And one of the areas I think where this shows up very often is in terms of, of physical health, right? I saw a post on Instagram the other day that said, you know, I, I think I think she did use the terms unhealthy and healthy, but she she said that unhealthy exercise is going because you think you're supposed to go, going based on a certain body type that you want to achieve, going a certain amount of times per week, whereas healthy exercise is really listening intuitively to your body and determining what is it that my body needs today instead of trying to conform to a shape and size. And that's obviously based on our cultural preference for thinness in, in our culture. So that's kind of what I mean by, is this goal your goal or was it based on somebody else's idea of what you should do? So speaking of physical, so physical, these are the things that we do to take care of our body in healthy ways. So some of the areas that you can take a look at for yourself are sleep hygiene, how you're eating, how much you're moving, Sexual activity, yes, is included on here. Um, and, you know, I don't believe that there's like a healthy level of sexual activity. I think that it's different for everybody, but something important for us all to look at. And are you going to the doctor? Are you going to the dentist to get your teeth cleaned? You know, did, has somebody told you that you have high cholesterol and you weren't willing to change your diet, right? Those things are super duper important to look at. And when there are barriers to some of these areas, oftentimes there's an emotional component to it. And sometimes that is connected with trauma. And so we have to be really honest with ourselves about what is it that is getting in the way of me taking care of myself. So I wrote down goals for myself in terms of these areas of wellness. And for physical, I put um, one of the things I really want to do is listen to my body. That, uh, that example that I gave you about unhealthy ways of exercise, I used to go four times a week and, and I had to do that or I was a bad person, like internally is what would happen. And I had a health condition uh, about that, well, that started about two years ago, um, but really went into full force about six months ago and I couldn't work out. I just couldn't. And I really had to internally grapple, grapple with this feeling of not being good enough based on this unhealthy expectation that I'd set for my body previously. And I had to reset the way that I looked at my body and what my body could, could do. Um, and so this year, my goal is to really listen to my body. Does it want to lift weights or does it want to do yoga? Or do I actually need to take a break from the gym today and just rest? So then we have the emotional area. So things that we do to take care of feelings in healthy ways. So maintaining personal and professional support systems. I just, I could not do this work without having a bunch of friends who are therapists. Uh, I feel like I'm constantly getting peer supervision, which is amazing for me. I could, I just can't talk about this stuff enough. Um, and then getting counseling or therapy is needed. 
some people might not like that I say this, but I truly believe that if we're in this field, we need to be having regular therapy. Um, because as we said earlier, if you don't heal the wounds that cut you, you'll bleed on people who did not, did not hurt you. Um, journaling, talking about feelings in healthy ways. So these are some of the things we do to attend to our emotional wellness. And for me, my goal for this year is to be more accepting of the vastness of my emotions. I tend to feel things at like a 12 when most people feel them at like a six, <laughs> it seems. And I, I've realized lately that I've spent so much time judging myself and criticizing myself for the vastness of my emotions. And so for me, my goal this year is to welcome those emotions and just notice and gather information from them rather than judging them and trying to change them. So the next level or the next area of wellness is cognitive. So things we do to take care of our mind and understand ourselves better. So reading for pleasure or work, writing, creating, taking a class, continuing education and knowledge or skill. Um, you know, one of the things I, I've been letting my students know lately is you know, when you get your graduate degree, your master's degree in counseling or social work or whatever it might be, that is not the end of our learning. That is just the beginning. And in order for us to really stay current in this field, we have to be doing, we have to be investing in our education uh, in order to really know, know what's current and know how best to help our clients. So my my, co my cognitive area of wellness, I'm going to say I've already been doing okay in this, and I actually probably need to soften it a little bit because uh, I like to learn. I like to learn so much. I'm kind of obsessed with it, and I sometimes I have to force myself to listen to music instead of listening to a podcast where I'm learning so that I'm able to actually take care of myself. <laughs> and then we shift into social. So social, the things I do to relax and spend time with others. So this is probably the area where I get a big old goose egg because if you're like me and you own your own business, you know you work all the time and I need to have more fun. And so one of my goals for 2020 is allowing myself to stop checking email to know that things are going to get done when they get done and not everything is an emergency and that it's okay to have fun. I was thinking recently. I, I don't remember where I heard this. I'm sure it was on a podcast, but but somebody saying that, you know, if I if I tell myself that resting is resting and working is working, then I'm setting myself up for failure because it's this black or white dichotomy. But if I look at rest as a tool to help me work, then it's productive, right? So if you're somebody like me who always wants to be productive, that's a good little cognitive trick to change the way we think about it. So then we get to financial, and these are the things we do to spend and save responsibly. And that includes, you know, looking at our accounts, planning for the future, spending money in thoughtful ways. And let's see, I'm trying to get to the Q&A here, bup, bup, bup. and it's not letting me right now. Hmm. Okay, I will make sure to answer your question at the end. I think I have to get out of this, um, this sharing mode in order to answer that. Um, so financial, I'll tell you for myself, this is probably also an area where I need a lot of help with. And my husband would tell you, yes, please, somebody help this girl. <laughs> He's tired of doing all the work in the financial realm. Um, and truthfully, there's emotional stuff in there. There's, there's underlying reasons why it's difficult for me to sit with financial stuff. I do not like numbers. I was raised in a lower middle class family where things were touch and go for several years after my parents got divorced. And, and so I, I, I kind of just pretend it's not there and that I don't have to worry about it. And I, I want to acknowledge that um, I have a decent amount of privilege that I can do that. And I know that not a lot of people have, or a lot of people have that privilege, but not everybody has that privilege uh, to, to be able to not think about the financial health piece of things. And then spiritual. I love that this is on here because I think spirituality can get a bad rap sometimes. I think that, you know, folks who are very invested in logic and science and uh, rationality can poo-poo the spiritual realm. 
Um, but spiritual and cognitive in, in this uh, wellness model are, are put up in the same camp against each other. Uh, and I'm a big proponent of, of spirituality being a, a great way to take care of ourselves. So, so things we do to gain perspective on our lives. So for me, it's this year I really wanted to focus on meditation and a more, uh, a more robust connection with my higher power. And it's something that about three and a half years ago, I made a commitment that I'm going to meditate every day. And it changed my life once I made that commitment. Um, and again, this, this one is especially like we have to make sure that we're doing something in a routine way to care for ourselves. And if you're somebody who's like, oh, I wanted to meditate and I can't, um, there's so many things out there, ways that we can help ourselves. And I love to talk about meditation. So if anybody wants to talk more about meditation, I'm super into it. Okay, let's see. Whoop, boop, boop, boop. And then the last two, environmental. So the things we do to create a livable space and environment. So we want to have a space that's free from distraction, noise, pollution, clutter, to-do lists, which if you saw what was around me right now, you'd be like, <gasps> gasp. Her environment is not very conducive to uh, calm. But la-di-da, one of the things I need to work on, um, allowing ourselves to disconnect from screens, allowing downtime and ad adequate space to cultivate play. So I learned the hard way that how disruptive it can be internally when we're not creating wellness in our environment. Um, I actually had mold in my house at the beginning of the fall and there was all this construction happening and there's construction on the house next door, literally jackhammers and radios and all kinds of things happening all the time. And for three months, I just internally felt like th there's nowhere that I can be comfortable because I can't be comfortable in my house. So one of the things that I'm committed to this year is not today, if you saw what's going on here, but really committing to trying to continue to have a space where I feel like I can be comfortable and be at peace so that I can internally settle down. And then this last, last one, occupational. So what do I do to make sure I'm aligned with my work-life purpose? So can I take breaks? Can I notice if I'm experiencing burnout and talk to my supervisor? Can I ask for help with diff difficult tasks? And for me, what I said is I'd like to be more aligned with what I love, which is stuff like this. I love teaching and I love learning. Can I be aligned with more of the things that I love instead of the parts of my work that I feel like I have to do? So I could spend all day answering emails and, and doing things that are, are, are not necessarily bringing me joy, but am I creating time for the things within my work that do bring me joy? So those are the areas of wellness. And I want to make sure that we talk about self-compassion because if we're setting ourselves up for this, you know, grand plan, okay, I'm going to tackle these eight areas of wellness and I'm going to, I'm going to change my life. I'm going to do all these things. If we're not practicing compassion with ourselves, we are setting ourselves up uh, for failure really. So Compassion, if you're familiar with Kristen Neff, Kristen Neff and Tim Desmond are really the two folks where I've gotten most of my information on, on self-compassion. So I highly recommend to check those out. So compassion really just means to suffer with, and then self-compassion is suffering with oneself. So essentially being able to recognize when we're suffering and give ourselves compassion for that humanity. Because it, it's so easy for us to look at somebody else and know oh, you're suffering, you're having this human experience and that's absolutely okay. But when I'm ha having that experience for myself, I just sit there and criticize and judge myself. Um, I'm also reading a book right now called Compassion and Self-Hate. And in that book, he talks about the way that we set ourselves up for self-criticism is by having this idealized version of ourselves. And he, one of the things that he suggests is, can we make a conscious commitment to soften uh, that, that version of ourselves that is completely unrealistic. So just as an example, I'm, I was super nervous for today. I get really nervous with webinars because I have no idea what you people are thinking or feeling out there. And I have no idea if it's resonating or not. I'm just talking into a vacuum. And so I started to get nervous last night and like, oh, I've got to go over these slides. And then I recognize like, wait, I am, I'm, I, I'm using that 
perfect version of myself that I'm comparing myself to the, the person who doesn't offend anybody ever, who, um, you know, only teaches you new things, who makes sure to deliver all the information perfectly and, you know, can transform the world in 60 minutes or less. Like that's ridiculous. And once I was able to tell my, I literally told myself, I am willing to soften that version of myself. I was able to go to sleep. Um, and that's, you know, I, I am grateful that I have the capacity to do that after a lot of meditating and a lot of, uh, a lot of work on self-compassion in particular. So self-compassion is a practice of goodwill, not good feelings. So self-compassion is not just affirmations because if we're just affirming ourselves, we're not actually attending to the parts of ourselves that hurt. And that is where the compassion really lies. So the hope is, is that we hold loving space for ourselves when we are experiencing negative emotions and possibly challenging, am I holding myself up to this impossible standard that I'm never going to meet? And am I willing to soften that? So what is self-compassion? So this comes directly from Kristen Neff. And if you go to her website, it's uh, www.self-compassion.org. If you go to her site, uh, you can actually test your self-compassion. And I've done it with clients and it can be extraordinarily helpful to look at the different components of self-compassion and what is getting in the way and what, what parts need to be attended to. So mindfulness versus over-identification, we have to be aware of the when we're suffering in order to attend to the suffering, right? So am I aware that I'm experiencing suffering right now, or if I'm over-identifying, I'm essentially fusing with the emotion and I'm not able to create space in order to make a decision about what I want to do with it. The next one, self-kindness versus self-judgment. What Kristen Neff says is, am I talking to someone like I love or am I talking to, to someone like, am I talking to myself like someone I hate? Um, and then finally, common humanity versus isolation. Do I understand that I am not alone, that I am not the only one experiencing this emotion. So we haven't all had the same experiences as each other, but we do all share human emotions. And when I'm feeling hurt or rejected or, or brokenhearted, I can go into martyr, <laughs> martyr mode real quick in that isolation place. And I have to pull out and remember that I am not alone in my suffering, that other people are there just, just like I am, and I'm not unique, and I'm not alone. So we are coming to the end of time here, and I want to make sure I can answer that question that was asked. Um, so in conclusion, I really want to hammer these three points home that wellness takes a commitment to practice. We have to practice on a regular basis. As we would tell our clients, we're not just going to show up one day and things be different. We're not just going to show up one day and love ourselves differently. We have to commit to a regular practice. Two, we can help our clients more effectively when we help ourselves. I don't think there's a bypass for this. I think that we have to do the work in order to take people through their own healing. And then three, wellness takes a combination of individual responsibility and collective support. So if we're in spaces where we don't have that collective support, can we be creative about how we connect with other people can we search for that in different ways if it's not readily available? And can I not take more responsibility than is mine, right? And share responsibility with the community as well as what is individually mine. So another reminder, I'll just kind of run through these very quickly. Um, some resources for you and... I will have this up on my website probably by the end of the day today if you'd like a download of these slides, um, a PDF version. And here is my information if people are interested in connecting. Just a reminder, um, please stick around if you are able to do so and complete the poll. And let's see, I've got four minutes. So, oh, that's all you wanted is a copy of the slides. So the answer is yes. So while we're here and we do have a few minutes left, are there any other questions about the information that I went through? I'll wait for just a minute and see if folks respond. I'll make sure you have this up here so you can copy down any of that information. Oh, thank you, Barb. Barb was just thanking me for a great presentation. I appreciate you being here. Um, 
Oh, the other thing I needed to tell you is that uh, you will get an email after the presentation about CEUs. And uh, so just stay tuned for that. It'll probably come tomorrow and you'll get that directly from C4. So I have a question here. Um, how would you suggest encouraging coworkers to practice self-care? Very tricky. So one thing that I have learned, thanks to Al-Anon, is that mostly it's attraction, not promotion. And I have to make sure that I am calling people in, right? And, and my goal is if I show up and move through the world in a certain way, I hope that other people are inspired by that and are interested in learning how I do that. And so um, we're not going to be able to inspire everybody to do that. And, and it is, it's, I mean, this is literally why I do these seminars because it's so important that I think therapists do their work. Um, you know, sometimes I just drop little things like, oh, I went to therapy today and it was amazing. And I've got this great insight, um, and really more sharing about my own experience than, um, than, than asking others to do it for themselves. And I think sometimes it can become a question of, am I in the right environment? Like, am I in an environment where it feels like I can take care of myself or am I in an environment where it's, it's not actually supportive of health. And then sometimes we have to make really hard decisions uh, if we find it's not supportive of our health. Yeah. Any other questions? Thank you folks so much. Oh, great. Thank you. I want to know how to pronounce your name. Is it Larney? I don't know, but I like it. So I, th I think that's all we've got. So please, please stick around uh, to do the poll and uh, let me know how this was for you. And like I said, you can go to my website. Um, hopefully my web guy will get it up later today. It, at the very minimum, it will be up tomorrow so you can get a copy of these slides if you'd like them. Okay, thank you so much, everyone. Bye-bye.